Last week, Etsco was in uh, Seattle at the International Conference on Functional Programming, ICFP, and associated events. He's actually been presenting some of his own work there. Um, but that's not what we're going to talk about today. I, I wasn't there. I stayed home, so I missed all the fun and excitement. So naturally, I'm quite curious to hear a little bit more about uh, what, uh, yeah, how the week was like and how the conference was like. So we thought that today we're going to just yeah, talk about the week that Etsco had at ICFP and highlight some of the Haskell work that has been presented by others there. Yeah, so welcome to the Haskell Unfolder, a YouTube series where we discuss all things Haskell. As always, this show is live streamed. We invite you to submit questions or comments in the chat, and we will try to show them on screen and discuss them. Yeah. Yes. So perhaps <clears throat> as a starting point, perhaps we should just uh, like explain to everyone, because not everybody probably has been at ICFP ever, so like what, what these conferences even are. So. Could you say a bit yeah, so that? ICFP is the International Conference on Functional Programming, and it's probably the most important conference, academic conference in the world of functional programming, at least especially in the world of Haskell, but also OCaml, uh, Coca, and other languages. Um, it's, a, it's a scientific conference, right? So people write scientific papers. They are submitted for review by peers. Um, other scientists read those papers. They, if they judge whether it's either going to be accepted or and whether it needs uh, too many other changes to be accepted at this point. And then the authors get detailed feedback uh, from the reviewers. They adjust the paper, resubmit, and then, uh, yeah, mm -hmm. just like the normal scientific process. So yeah, right. it's a big and, conference. And ICFP is actually sort of like a whole um, uh, mix of events, right? So ICFP is the main conference, but there are like a lot of associated events. Um, so. Yeah, so yeah, exactly. So normally, I mean, ICP is a standalone thing, but normally it's co-located with a whole bunch of other events. Mm -hmm. um, and in terms of Haskell, the most relevant other ones are the Haskell Implementers Workshop, mm -hmm. which normally happens before ICFP, and the Haskell Symposium, which happens after. And what, like, what's the difference between all these three, like ICFP on, and then Haskell Symposium and Haskell Implementers Workshop? Yeah, so I think the ICFP tends to be the most theoretical. So papers submitted there tend to work on, I don't know, type systems, semantics, operational semantics, denotational semantics, mathematical proofs, things mm -hmm. like this, right? Um, Haskell Symposium tends to be more applied and is Haskell specific. I mean, it's in the name, right? Whereas ICFP yeah. is, is broader <laughs> than that. Um, yeah. uh, and the Haskell Implanters Workshop is not a scientific congress. It's uh, There's no papers associated with them. It's uh, just people who work primarily on GHG or the runtime or the garbage collector, things like this, uh, presenting their work. Simon, Simon Payton Jones often gives a, uh, a talk, uh, usually together with Ben Kamari, well types Ben Kamari, who does the GHG manage, uh, like their maintenance, um, giving an overview of all the changes in GHG in the past year and then uh, what's expected for the next year. So yeah, that's a, that's a much more informal event where people discuss things like what has happened and what they, what needs to be done. Right. And so in, in terms of size, are these like uh, very oh. different? I don't have exact numbers for you, but I sus I mean, ICP is by far the largest. I mean, hundreds mm -hmm. of people. Right. Um, Haskell Symposium, I guess, would be the next one that maybe, I don't know, 100, maybe mm -hmm. a little bit more. And then Haskell Implanters Workshop, I don't know, maybe 60, 70 people, something mm. like this. I mean, yeah. like, I mean, this is yeah, yeah, sure, of course. I mean, this this roughly matches what I remember from the years I've been there, but of course, it fluctuates a bit from yeah, from year yeah, to yeah. year, and and yeah. also from day to day, actually, because not sure. Uh, and in in terms of attendance, like I mean, like you're saying, they're primarily academic conferences, but obviously, you're like now working for Well Type these days, and uh, like are still interested in academia, I guess, but uh, but are from industry. Is there? Like, yeah, um, so I, I, it's primarily an academic event, I suppose. Yeah. I mean, I used to be an academic also before my well-type days. Mm. Uh, but industry is also well, well, present, well represented. I mean, comp big companies like uh, Jane Street, Galwa, companies like this have a, have a mm. strong presence there. Um, also smaller companies just send people there. And also um, lots, lots of PhD students. Uh, mm. And one thing that I was surprised by uh, was also quite a few undergrads and master students. Apparently, there's funding available for, for that now, which is, which is nice to see. Yeah, I said, but I mean, in principle, 
everybody can go right i mean it's also yes. open to hobbyists and so i mean it's it's not sure. free i mean you no. it's, it's actually it's not even, expensive yeah it's quite <laughs> expensive but but uh, yeah i mean otherwise you can you can definitely go and um, yeah okay and also i mean i should i mean also mention yeah. most of the papers maybe all papers are also freely available um, mm. yeah and also the all the talks were live streamed as well so you can find those on um, mm. um I think right now they're like one big video per day or something. Yeah, like but they're probably going to be edited. But, yeah, but it's yeah. But yeah. If you're interested, you can look at those. Yeah. Okay. So um, I, before we look at specific papers, I guess we should like add a little bit of a disclaimer that obviously this is a subjective look at like. Um, uh, some specific Haskell works that you found interesting, and that there have been many other great papers that we don't want to um like <laughs> make smaller yeah, this than is, they are i mean yeah yeah this is not at all like i selected three yeah. papers i selected them mm -hmm. on the basis of are they applied mm -hmm. and can i talk about them in a meaningful way in a few minutes in this episode yeah. all right that's that's basically and, the whole and are they about Haskell, right and, yeah right Haskell, um, yes, yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah okay yeah so um what's what's the first paper yeah. you want to talk about uh, right so let me share my screen here Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, as always, all this code is going to be available in the repository that goes with the mm -hmm. unfolder. But uh, the first paper I want to talk about is called Hardcore Functional um, Choreographic Programming for All, mm -hmm. um, which, um, which was a functional pearl, uh, which so that means that it's a paper that explains how to do something in a very nice way, um, mm -hmm. comes with a library. It's not necessarily designed to be production ready. It's designed to illustrate a particular way of doing things in a very nice way. And this was at ICFP itself, right? Yes, yes. This was at ICFP itself at the main conference. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, okay. And and the authors are Gan Shen, Shun Kashiva, and Lindsay Cooper. I see. Yes. Okay. Um. And and I must admit that I have no idea what choreographic programming is, but you're probably going to explain that. Uh. Well, I don't know. <laughs> anything about either until I heard the presentation. <laughs> um, so, you know, I learned something there. Okay. So the idea is that if you have a concurrent system, right, with multiple nodes in a system, maybe a client or a server, but it could also be more than two parties, uh -huh. you typically want some sort of guarantee that they stick to the same protocol, right? That the server gets only messages from the client that they expect and so forth. Is it now, a bit like session types? Or... Yeah, right. So there's a lot of work on type system for this sort of thing. And session types is, is the most important uh, example there. Um, so in session types, yeah, session types, if you have a session type, then basically what that says is that the server must send a message of type A, then expect a message of type B, then send something of type C and so forth. And then we have sort of a, a dual to this on the other side, you know, so that the two match up. Mm -hmm. And there are also multi-party session types. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of checking that these things match up, but you still write them separately. Um, mm -hmm. The whole point of choreographic programming is that we don't write them separately. Instead, we write one program. So there cannot be any uh, difference in protocol because we're only writing one thing. And then we're projecting out uh, the individual nodes. So we're going mm -hmm. to write one description of the whole choreography. That's you know, uh, And then we can project out the server and the client from it. Okay, that sounds interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I wanted to show this with a simple example. So in this example, um, we're only going to have uh, two roles. So we're going to have a server, and we're going to have a client, and these are identified at the type level because at the type level we want to keep track of who knows what. And so we have two type level strings which um, mm -hmm. talk about these two roles here. And then what we're going to do is that we, the client is going to send um, messages to the server and it's going to send instructions to the server. And it's going to send one of two instructions. It's the server is going to maintain some internal state, which is like a, a counter, just going to one, two, three, four. Um, so the, the client is going to tell the server either get the current count mm -hmm. or increment it. Okay. Um, and we're going to derive show and read, which is how the library communicates. And then the server is going to respond. And if the client sends get, then the server is going to respond with the current tick. And if the client sends increment, then the server is going to respond with done. OK. All right, so that's the basic idea. Um, and so now we are going to define the choreography. 
Um, and like I said, this thing is going to describe the whole system, right? Not just um, one of the roles, but all the roles at once. Mm -hmm. um, so we do, however, need um, some local state, right? We need the state of the client and we need the state of the server. And for the client, we're just going to maintain a bool saying, do you want to send? And the bool is going to talk all true, false, true, false. And if it's true, we're going to send a get. And if it's false, we're going to send increments. And the server okay. also needs a bit of state, which is the current count. Mm -hmm. um, so what we're going to do is that the client state is this mvar of a bool, which lives at the client. Only the client has access to this. And so this at thing here is a new type introduced by the library. It says, we have some value of this type available at in this role here. So the client has access to this, the server does not. And for the server, we have something similar, but now it's the int. And the whole query is important here that it is an mvar because it's just the client and there is just one client. No, or... it could be an IORF. It's just okay. more convenient. Okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's not, not important whatsoever. Okay. Yeah, it's, yeah. All right. Uh, and so now we have a choreo, this choreo monad, which is the main monad introduced by the paper, which is actually a monad transformer. So we have an underlying monad, which in this case is IO. Okay. All right, so we have our client state and our server state here. And what we're going to do is we're going to loop. And so a loop is just this choreo thing here. So what we're going to do is, first of all, the client is going to decide what instruction to send to the server. So we're going to construct something of type instruction at the client, right? So this is something that the client determines. Mm -hmm. um, so what we're going to do is we're going to run something locally on the client. The server's not going to do anything at all here. They're just we're doing something on the client side. So that's locally construct here comes from the library. It says we're going to run something locally on this node. Now mm -hmm. this un function, this unwrap function allows us to take something at the client, some value at the client, and unwrap it to get the underlying value. Right? So here, inside here, we have access to the client's the state here, the client state, because it lives at the client. We don't have access to the server state because it lives at the server, but we have access to the client state. Right, right. So, and because an mvar bool at client is not an mvar bool yet, but if we apply un to it, then we simply yes. get the mvar bool. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. And if That's we would apply it to something that is at a different uh, node, then it would be a type error. Yes, you get a type error. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, we can actually try that. Um, so, if I try this to the server state, uh, it says, uh, oh, Undefined, uh, misspelled. I beg your pardon. Yeah, couldn't match type server with client. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Very good. So, um, right. Mm -hmm. So we get the client state, and we're going to modify it. All right. This is the mvar now. Remember. Mm -hmm. So we have some bool here. And now, what we're going to do if that boolean is false, then mm -hmm. and the instruction that we're going to return is get, and we just toggle the boolean. So we send alternate, mm -hmm. alternating instructions all the time. And if it's true. Then we still toggle and we return increment. Okay. And so now we have a, a, a we constructed a message that lives currently at the client. Now we need to send it from the client to the server. Right? So typically you have a send message, uh, send primitive and a receive primitive. Since we are describing the whole thing as a single choreography, we have a single communicate primitive, which mm. then is interpreted either as a send or a receive by the library. Mm. So, um, um, oh, yes, and. But actually, in this case, it's a bit more tricky even because we want to do something different depending on which instruction that we're sending, right? If it's mm -hmm. and that, so there's a library actually has a we can't pattern match on this, right? Because this is not an instruction, this is an instruction at the client, right? This mm -hmm. is not something that we can pattern match on. So the library actually has a conditional. So we're going to say we're going to sort of pattern match in quotes on this value that lives at the client here. And what happens is that the, the library will make sure that to insert communication primitives to, to broadcast this choice to all the parties involved. Right. So at this point, the server also knows which instruction the client picked. But I'm, I'm slightly confused because I thought that we are going to send whatever message we constructed to the server in any case. So why do we need a conditional now? And not just after. We could have done this also. We, I mean, there's, there, there's different ways to do it. Oh, OK. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just okay. wanted to show off the, the conditional as well. So, okay. but yeah, yeah, there's yep. multiple ways to do it. Mm -hmm. All right, so now this inster now is an almost uh, 
instruction, right? No longer wrapped in anything because all parties now know it. So we can uh, do something with it. So we're going to construct a response on the server side, mm -hmm. right? So we're again going to ro locally run something. We get an unwrap function again, just like before. We're going to now um, modify the server states, which is this other thing here, which has a count, mm -hmm. right? And now we can fat match on this instruction. Um, if we're getting something, then we just like we don't change state at all, uh, and we return the current. And if we're incrementing, then we do increment, and we return done. Um, right. Okay, so now we have a response uh, that lives on the server, mm -hmm. and now we can do what you suggested that we did earlier, right? We can just now send it um, to this to the client. And now we're going to use this communicate primitive that uh, I mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. Now we have a response at the client. And so now finally we can um, run something locally on the client again, um, which is just print the response. Say. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, All right. And now again, I don't longer need the. We don't uh, need the undefined anymore. The undefined and then anymore. the warnings go away. And yeah. again, so the, the cons is actually kind of sending as well yes it's right. broadcasting yeah yeah it's broadcasting even yeah yeah I so mean, if there's we have two parties but yeah yes mm -hmm. in, in, yeah in general there's n parties right and so mm -hmm. yeah okay yeah. Mm -hmm. right and so now for the main application uh i'll just copy and paste the the example so i can quickly go over it this is the uh just a top level infrastructure stuff here so mm -hmm. we make the client state which is a new environment server state the client process we just run the choreography which is from the, coming from the library we give it some way to run it. In this case, we're running it over HTTP, um, over HTTP. Then the choreography for the clients, we give it the client state and the server state is empty. So this is this at thing, which is either a value or not. It's basically like maybe, right? Um, right. Mm -hmm. And then for the server, we do the way around. Like there's no client state, now we do a server state. And then we just start both up and- yeah, Right, and this it. is like a projection, yeah, projection to the client, projection to the server. And then yes, okay. yes, yes, exactly. So this is, exactly. So this is where we're projecting out the different roles. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. precisely. Okay, and then you start both of them. Okay, can we see it running or does it? Uh, we can try. Let's see if I made a mistake somewhere. Always a bit dangerous. And let's see. Oh, yeah, I did make a mistake. So we see the first one, but then nothing else. And that's because I forgot to loop. <laughs> uh -huh. True. So uh, after we do all of this, we just need to loop. Let's try this again. It's actually even more convincing that if you. I know it works. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. OK, nice. All right. Okay, so this is a very quick overview. Um, mm -hmm. Of course, there's links to the paper as well as to the library itself, uh, as well as to the presentation, which you can watch online. Mm -hmm. So the next demo I want to show you is from a different paper called An Exceptional Actor, oops, not Actor ID, Actor System, um, which is also functional for which was presented at the Haskell Symposium. And the point of this paper is that they want to point out that async and exceptions in Haskell are more powerful than you might think. And they show this by actually implementing actors in a couple of lines of Haskell um, using asynchronous exceptions. So I thought this well, might be nice to show. Um, yeah, just because we have also been talking about asynchronous exceptions in the yeah, exactly. last episode, right? And exactly. um, right. general bracket episode. Yeah. Yes, 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 yes. So this will be another, it uh, will be a chance to, um, to review some of that. Um, yeah. And I will take an opportunity as well at the end to just talk about different paper in the same context. But for now, let's mm -hmm. just focus on the actor stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so I will do redo the implementation that they do in the paper. Um, not in, I won't stick to the paper completely faithfully, but mostly. So actor system is like, I don't know, Cloud Haskell or Erlang, right? I mean, exactly. Or, yeah. yeah. So we have okay. communicating processes, the mailboxes, message, message based concurrency, essentially. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Exactly. yeah. Right. So an actor, we're going to represent by a thread. So an mm -hmm. actor ID is going to be just a thread ID. Mm -hmm. Then messages that we're going to send, we are going to wrap it in an envelope. And that envelope is going to have a sender and a message. And we want to be able to send messages of different types. So we use the Haskell's dynamic types for this. 
the paper uses exception switch. Uh, it does a little bit more wrapping, but exceptions basically use the same thing under the hood as well. So, um, right. So we're going to send these as exceptions. So uh, we need to derive exception for this. Um, um, we are going to if if the client sorry if an actor receives a message of a type that it doesn't expect, it's going to throw this wrong message exception. Um, and then finally, um, we're going to define the intent of an actor. Um, I don't know why. I mean, the paper you chose this word intent. I hadn't seen this before, but uh, as sort of the thing that processes incoming messages, right? So it takes the receiver of a message, the message itself, and then um, it does something with it. So how do we send something then, right? If we want to send a message to another actor, some uh, some message, well, uh, what we're going to do is we take the recipient of the message and the message that we want to send. We need our own thread ID because we need to include the sender's ID, right, in the message. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. we're just going to use throw to, which is how we throw these in the exceptions in Haskell, to that thread. Right, right, wrapping it in the in this envelope. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so this makes sense. And then how do we? Uh, so that define... throws this envelope thing as an asynchronous exception, right? Yes. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right, so how do we construct one of these intent functions? Well, um, we um, what we're going to do is we have some function that takes some a for some type of a, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and so. Then what we're going to do is we're going to use uh, from dynamic, which is a function that uh, that we're checking if this message has this type, and if it does, then we can call the function that we are given. Hmm. And if it doesn't, we're going to throw that exception that um, that I mentioned. That is wrong message. Yes. Check. Okay. And you could imagine that you can now chain these things, right? So if you have um, one intent that handles exception of one, or a message of one type. Then, if it throws a raw message exception, you could imagine that we can catch it and then uh, try the next one. So we can chain these intent things so we can handle multiple uh, multiple types of messages. Mm -hmm. And so we're nearly there now. The only thing that we need to do now is how do we start one of these actors? Uh, and here I'm deviating slightly from the paper, but um, I don't think I will, I'm really misrepresenting it. What, we, what I'm defining is a way to spawn a new actor. So we give you give me an intent function, and I'll give you an actor ID. So this is kind of like fork, right? And what we're going to do is we're going to disable all asynchronous exceptions. Then okay. fork. Now when we fork, that means that the new thread will inherit the masked exception state. So exceptions can't be thrown to the new thread. And then we're going to loop. Okay. Now what we're going to do in this loop is we're going to maintain an inbox of messages, right? This is our mailbox. Mm -hmm. um, now, since asynchronous exceptions are masked at this point, they can't be delivered right until we unmask. That's what we talked about in the previous episode. Mm. What we didn't talk about in the previous episode is that there's also a different way that we can punch holes through this mask, which is when we execute an interruptible operation. And yeah, we, we mentioned should do, that we should do a whole episode about brief, this briefly at the end, yeah. because there was a question about this. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. we should do a whole episode on this. Uh, it's an important topic, but for now, it's mm -hmm. important to know that. Um, Blocking operations, so take MVAR, thread delay, things like this, are interruptible, which means that they can receive asynchronous exceptions even when asynchronous exceptions have been masked. Hmm. So what we're going to do in this loop is we're going to look at the inbox. And if it's empty, we have no messages to deliver, to, to, to receive, right? Mm -hmm. So what we're going to do uh, is we're going to delay, thread delay. It doesn't really matter. This number here is not really relevant. Right? Mm -hmm. Just wait for some time. If, and the and idea is that it can be interrupted. Right? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. This is interruptible. So if a message comes in while we're waiting, this mm. will be interrupted. Uh, we will yeah. be interrupted here, which means that we need to catch that message. Right? So mm -hmm. this whole thing needs to um, live in an exception handler, right? Which is going mm -hmm. to return receive a new envelope, right? And if we receive one, we just add it to the mailbox uh, at the end, and we're preserved. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, and then here, um, if we are not, if we don't receive a message, we just loop. We just try the same thing again. If we do have a message to process, then um, we can um, run our intent function. Oh, not intent. Intent. intent yeah. Uh, it needs to know the sender and the message, and then not the server, the sender, and then we just loop the remaining of the inbox. 
Now there's one uh, subtlety here, well actually two subtleties. One is that if this thing throws a wrong message exception, that means that the server, sorry, the client, whoa, whoa, well, maybe not the client, but whoever sent us this message, sent us a message that we were not expecting, right? Which is not really our fault, it's their fault, right? They sent us the wrong message. So we should catch that, and if it happens, we should send that message back to the sender. And so if this message, if this exception is raised, then we're going to raise it in the sending thread instead. Uh huh. Yeah. Uh, and that's it. Now the only there's an important gotcha here, which is that if this run intent function itself has interruptible operations in there, maybe it does a thread delay of its own, for example, right? Then that too will be interruptible. And that too, would, 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 so that means that if that is happening and another message comes in at that point, the action will be interrupted, right? The exception will be thrown. We will uh, go to this case, like this description handler, and we will add the new message that came in to the end of the inbox. And we try and again, right? Which means that the message that we had been dealing with at that point, we will deal with again. Uh -huh. uh, so this is just a, we're not going to fix that. That's just the property of uh, of how the library set things up. There, there's of course ways that you can fix it. So that's a kind of an acknowledged shortcoming of the paper itself. Yes. Or, okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So just to um, briefly show how this might work, um, I'm just going to re-implement the logic that we had in the previous one, right? So we have the same instructions, the same response, mm -hmm. one additional message, right? Because the client needs to start processing at some point. So I'm just going mm -hmm. to send the initial message saying start. Then the server is going to be uh, uh, um, this intent function, right? Which is going to process instructions. So what do we do? We get an instruction. We exactly the same as before, right? We, oops, uh, let me uh, not use the breakpoints just yet. We look at the instruction. If it's get, we return it. If it's increment, we succeed. Uh, sorry, we so take the successor. We send the response back and we just loop this, uh, like we just process every message like this. And so this is just doing the same logic that we had before. And then in the client, we need to do two things, right? We need to um, process two kinds of messages, the client start message, in which case we call go. So when we start go, we just delay like before, we modify the client state. If it's false, we send get. If it's true, we send increments, and then we send that to the server, just like before, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then when we get the response from the um, server, uh, we print it and then we just loop. We do, we do we go again, and so they're they're ping ponging back and forth here. Yeah, but I mean here you can actually nicely I mean see if you if you scroll back up right um, like a little bit uh, that we we have the server and the client separate and there is some duplication that we didn't have in the corridor. I mean I think this is actually nice to see it like I mean <laughs> in contrast you know, to the previous one that is projecting out of the of the server and the client actually. Yes, yeah, I, yeah. I think it depends a little bit on the on the specifics yeah. of the application. Sometimes it's it's nicer to have them as like we like the composition house called too, right? So um, sometimes it's nice to be able to do that. But yeah, um, yeah, it depends. Yep. On it yeah. Okay. All right. So then uh, our main function um, is the same as before. Uh, well, not the same, but like similar. We create the client server state. We spawn two actors. Um, then I send the start to the client, and then we just wait. All right, so mm -hmm. I can try to run this too. And let's hope that I didn't mess up somewhere. I am still a bit jet lagged from coming back from Seattle. Um, ah, it's working. All right, good, nice. All right. Okay. So um, in the last five minutes, I know we're we, running a little we have bit out of a, time. Yeah, we also have questions. So I mean, oh, let, yeah, let's okay. just. I mean, sure. this is a challenge today with like three, sure, like three different papers or or um, things. Mm -hmm. And and uh, but let's just do a few minutes longer. Um, so we actually also had a question about the previous one. Um, okay. But but let's start with the one about the current. Um, oh, sorry. Actually, I mean, it's two parts, but I'll read the first one out. This message inbox and dynamic matching on types is very close to the Erlang model. There, there is usually a crash on any error with supervisors to restart. How does this compare? Can we crash the whole thread here or and just restart? Or will we need to be more careful in Haskell? Yeah, so I, I don't think... 
Yeah, if you wanted to linking, uh, they talk a little bit about it in the paper. Uh, you need to wrap your actor in a finally handler that then sends messages around. You need to do a bit more bookkeeping. Um, well, I don't, I don't remember what the first part was. Oh, the. No, that was just sort of basically setting the scene for for this question. Like, I mean. But I don't know. Can we crash the whole thread? I don't understand. Sorry. Okay, and the next one. Oh, yeah. So I guess this is talking about if we receive a message of a type that we're not expecting. Um, uh -huh. Yeah, there is not. I mean, yeah, that's. I mean, you're right. Of course, this is an important part of Erlang, or even like the the actor models and in, in Scala, what's it called, Aka or something. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, like let it crash, right? This whole philosophy. Mm -hmm. That's not really supported in this library at the moment. Like this, I mean, you could hack it on top of it, but it's not really something that's, yeah, that's available by default. And uh, Finley is also asking something. Patrick Redmond noted that there was one some way to avoid processing the same message twice, but I can't recall what it was. How could you do that here? That my, my yeah, I mean, what I would do is I would not use this as. Um, as a pure value, I would have an IO ref. And so every time you would go around the loop, we look at the IO ref, or maybe even an M bar or something, right? That we can, no, no, my IO ref would do. Uh, an IO ref so that we can really modify the IO ref, take a message out, so that then if we try again, then the message won't be duplicated. But the paper makes the explicit point that we don't need updates, like stateful updates, to implement this. So that's why I didn't go that way. Right. And then we had another question about the original. Um, demo by Mati. Um, okay. Very cool choreography library. I'm wondering, will this work with multiple clients, but only one server, or will it get confused? I think it's the whole point that it would work, right? I mean, uh, well, yes or no. I'm not sure that I understand the question right. But I think if I understand the question correctly, I had the same question. Um, so yes, I mean, I think what Anders is talking about is that you can have any number of parties that you wish. Uh, mm -hmm. I suspect that's not what the question is about. If I have the same server, but I want to run it against different kinds of clients that talk to that server, then for each combination, I would need a different choreography. Hmm. Which is, um, yeah. All right. So that's, okay. me, that's a downside of this sort of approach. OK. Um, yes, so you wanted to demonstrate one more thing. Let's, let's, let's yeah, still that, do that, because I think uh, like, yeah, it's uh, a nice, it's a nice, it's a nice yes, yeah. I, I, I think so too. And it won't take very much time. Mm -hmm. So if we go back to the demo here of the actors here, and the last thing I want to talk about is this uh, plugin by, written by Aaron Allen that he presented at the Household Implanters workshop. Um, so it's it's on Hackage, so you need to, the breakpoint library, uh, and you need to declare the plugin, debug the breakpoint. And what you can do now is at um, basically arbitrary points in your code, if you want to have a breakpoint, you can do that um, by calling breakpoint. And so, for example, I can call breakpoint here. Uh, what is the error here? Oh, not in. Oh, sorry. Let's maybe more put it. More uh, I'll, yeah, I'll put it here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I just insert a breakpoint here. And now, if mm -hmm. I run this thing again, then as soon as that server thing is hit, we get a breakpoint. Let me make this a little bit bigger. Uh, and the nice thing is it doesn't just break, it stops all the threads, right? The client was, okay. mm -hmm. uh, all the threads in the system are stopped. And also you will get a, a dump to your console of the things that you have in scope, right? So it tells oh, us that the instruction nice. is get, it tells us that the sender was thread ID uh, three. So it and checks service what's in scope. Okay, I see. Yes, that's why it's a plugin, right? Um, right, uh-huh. And, and it, the plugin is used for two things. It used, yeah, uh, right. One is to check what's in scope and also to make sure that we can print them. And if we can't print them, such as MVAR, that we get uh, just a type of it uh, instead. So this is, okay. I thought this was really rather nice. Um, but printing will, I mean, if it's like printing using show, then it can like cause evaluations that would otherwise not happen. Yes, right? yes, 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 exactly. So that's, yeah, that's something to be aware of. If mm -hmm. that is not what you want, there is uh, the library offers uh, a primitive that says, like, I want you to show what's in scope, but I want you to exclude this particular variable. Mm -hmm. okay. All right, so that's available. 
Um, and yeah, so, that, nice. yeah, yeah, I thought it was quite nice. Um, maybe the last thing I'll show is that the library also has a pure function here. So I can stick a breakpoint here, for example. This is a pure function, right? Here. Mm -hmm. um, and if I do that, then, um, so now we get the breakpoint only on the increment instruction. But when so, is it actually like if uh, I guess if if the expression is evaluated to weaker normal form, right? Yeah, exactly. Just like debug the trace does, right? Once this thing yeah. gets reduced to weaker normal form, then mm -hmm. the breakpoint gets hit. So if you never evaluate it, the breakpoint might also never um, execute. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think mm -hmm. in probably most cases you probably want to uh, you probably will prefer breakpoint I/O, uh, but in some cases the the pure function might be nice. And useful. Um, mm -hmm. Then we get the same things. We get what's in scope here, and it also prints actually the result of the whole expression. So it tells us that the result is is this thing here, which I think is also nice. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, I thought this is a quite a nice, uh, cool little library, and it. Um, Aaron went through a lot of effort to to make sure that it works well. That, for example, if you have multiple running threads, that they don't get confused by the delays. Like it adjusts the timing manager to make that happen. Things like this. So mm. he went through quite a bit of effort to. Um, to make this work. So yeah, I thought that was worth worth pointing out. OK. I don't see any additional questions right now. And we are a bit over time. So I guess we can probably just leave it at that. Um, All right. Sure. Yeah. OK. So um, yeah, thank you for watching this episode of the Haskell Unfolder. Um, if you liked it then please like and subscribe and um uh, again perhaps like of course if there are authors of icfp papers or haskell symposium papers among uh, the audience that we haven't mentioned i mean this is not uh, in any way uh like uh saying that that the other papers weren't cool um as Edsko mentioned initially we we are just trying to pick something which has a, like a little bit of a story to tell and uh, and is about Haskell and is easy enough to present in a very short amount of time. Um, but yeah, we will be back in two weeks. Uh, hopefully, see you then. Um.